Welcome to WAM webinar series. Throughout April, the Canadian Autism Spectrum Disorder Alliance will be hosting a series of webinars related to the National Autism Strategy in honor of World Autism Month. Thank you for registering and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. My name is Rebecca Kinsinger and I am an autistic individual on the board of directors with CASDA. CASDA's vision is for all autistic Canadians and their families to have full and equitable access to the resources they need across the lifespan, where and when they need it. At CASDA, we are committed to ensuring the creation and implementation of a comprehensive national autism strategy that addresses the critical gaps in funding and policies which are preventing individuals who are autistic and their families from exercising their individual and equal rights as Canadians. Hi, I'm Mark Wadelin. I'm a board member at CASTA, and CASTA is a national organization working with leaders in the field of autism, parents, researchers, individuals with autism, people from big agencies, small agencies, to develop a national autism strategy that will make a difference in the lives of Canadians with autism. You'll see logos of our members from across the country, big and small. You'll also see a slide that has the logos of our, some of our key partners, who, while they're not in the autism field, recognize that their work has an impact on the lives of Canadians with autism. Together, we're stronger. Together, we're louder. Together, we can make a big difference. Join CASDA. Be part of this movement that is going to create a better Canada for Canadians with autism. I'm Leslie Peters, a board member with CASDA. On CASTA's website, the strategic plan is found in the About Us tab. CASTA represents the voice of autistic individuals, those who work with them, and those who love them. We engage federal policymakers on issues that impact individuals with autism across Canada. In the Our Work tab, you will find important resources. From 2007 onward, CASTA has worked toward a national autism strategy. Steps along the way include the Canadian Autism Partnership Project and the Blueprint for a National Autism Strategy. Hi, I'm Debbie Irish, the Chair of CASDA's Board of Directors. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to this year's 7th Annual Canadian Autism Leadership Summit taking place in Ottawa on October 5th and 6th. This is a great opportunity to engage with government while a national autism strategy is being developed. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for making this a truly remarkable event. Please register now at www.casda.ca. So good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from across the country today. Welcome to today's webinar, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Jonathan Lai. I'm the Director of Strategy and Operations here at CASDA and I'll be your host for the webinar today. Um, I'm excited to host the session today on a, Nash, uh, on a human rights lens and the national autism strategy. Today's speaker is Tabitha Tranquilla. Tabitha is the Acting uh, Director of Policy Research and International Development at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. For many years, she has served as the Commission's focal point for engagement at the international level including with the United Nations. Um, she has extensive policy development expertise in a number of areas, including disability rights. Um, I've worked with uh, Tabitha as part of the National Disability Coalition Leadership Group um, over the last two years, and she's been a great supporter of the work that civil society organizations like CASA are doing in a reporting to the United Nations. Today, she'll be talking to us about uh, the human rights uh, lens uh, what they do at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, uh, their role in both the protection and the promotion of human rights, and also how human rights interface with the National Autism Strategy. So before I hand uh, the time over to Tabitha, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, we will be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, and we have enabled the Ask a Question feature in the chat. Um, depending on which device you're using, but typically if you hover your mouse or move around, um, there's a toolbar uh, next to the chat that you can uh, pop a question in there. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we will be posting this recording on our YouTube channel uh, where you'll find some of our previous webinars and other related content. And sign up for our policy working groups that we talked about last week's webinar. Um, that can also be found on our channel. 
And lastly, before I uh, bring it over, uh, let Tabitha start sharing screen, I want to uh, introduce, uh, encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks directly, um, tagging the National Autism Strategy hashtag. Um, you can also retweet and share cast Twitter and Facebook posts linked to the webinar to share with your networks. So without any further ado, I would like to kick things off uh, by welcoming Tabitha. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is certainly my pleasure uh, to be here today. Uh, as Jonathan indicated, uh, I'm Tabitha Tranquilla and I'm the Director of Policy Research and International Relations at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Um, I'm hoping today to, to first of all start off uh, with a bit of an overview of what the Canadian Human Rights Commission is for those who are less familiar with the organization. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, a human rights lens. What does that mean? Uh, and what could that mean in your work uh, as you uh, develop and implement a national autism strategy? Um, I, I plan on speaking for I don't know, a little while. Uh, and then I do welcome uh, any and all questions that you have. My presentation today will be uh, in English. Um, however, uh, I'm pleased to take your comments and questions en français as well. Uh, and uh, the slideshow that you see in front of you will be uh, again uh, in English as opposed to a split screen, uh, but it is available en français. Uh, and if you would like a copy of that, uh, then please uh, note that in the feedback form and we will make sure that we get one to you. So just an overview, I'm going to talk a bit about the Canadian Human Rights Commission and specifically I'm going to talk in more detail about the promotion mandate that we have. I'm going to talk a bit about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities specifically and the Commission's role in monitoring uh, the implementation of that instrument here in Canada. And then I want to talk a bit about uh, human rights lens and what that means uh, and possible synergies between some of the work that the Commission does and the National Autism Strategy. <laughs> so firstly, about the organization uh, of which I'm a part the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, the, it has a, a broad mandate to both promote and protect human rights. We administer the Canadian Human Rights Act uh, and conduct employment equity audits under the Employment Equity Act. We also have a number of new mandated responsibilities uh, by virtue of some legislation that passed uh, in the last parliament. So the Accessible Canada Act, which some might be familiar with, as well as the Pay Equity Act and the National Housing Strategy Act. We've also been designated with responsibility to monitor Canada's implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and I'll be talking uh, in more detail about that specific mandated responsibility in a little while. Our protection mandate may be the one that you're most familiar with, if you are familiar uh, with, the, with the institution at all. It involves dealing with complaints of discrimination within federal jurisdiction. All jurisdictions in Canada have legislation similar to the Canadian Human Rights Act, and there are provincial and territorial human rights commissions in most jurisdictions, almost all, uh, that similarly deal with complaints of discrimination. In terms of federal jurisdiction, that includes uh, the services and employment uh, in federal government departments and agencies, including Crown Corporations, First Nations, <clears throat> the RCMP and Canadian Forces, and the federally regulated private sector, which includes any kind of cross-provincial or international transportation companies, telecommunication, airlines, banking, uh, there's a number of, of entities that would fall within federal jurisdiction in terms of private sector enterprises. In federal jurisdiction, uh, there are 13 prohibited grounds of discrimination. These vary somewhat between jurisdictions. Some, have, some of the provinces and territories have more uh, prohibited grounds of discrimination, some have fewer. Disability uh, is one of the, of the prohibited grounds of discrimination in all jurisdictions. And consistently, a majority of complaints of discrimination that are received at the federal level, uh, as well as in all jurisdictions across Canada are filed uh, citing the ground of disability. 
Last year, 53% of all complaints received by the Canadian Human Rights Commission cited the ground of disability. And of those, more than half uh, cited mental disability specifically. It was about 27% of all the cases that we received last year that were filed on the basis of discrimination uh, based on a mental disability. In addition to the complaints handling mandate, which is the majority of our promotion mandate, we also have an expansive promotion mandate. And it is the one that people tend to be less familiar with if they are familiar with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. So the commission is what's known as a national human rights institution, which makes it a little bit different than uh, the provincial and territorial commissions uh, that you might also be familiar with. Beyond the complaints handling, our mandate is not restricted uh, to federal jurisdiction, to matters of anti-discrimination, or to the 13 prohibited grounds. And we are free to take up any matter of human rights and freedoms that we wish to uh, without any kind of limitation. What does that mean <laughs> in terms of what our promotion powers are? <clears throat> so we exercise our promotion mandate in a number of ways. We, uh, these are just some examples. There are a hundred others. Uh, we engage with Parliament stakeholders, we issue public statements and engage with the media, including through uh, social media, on our website, and in other ways. Uh, we develop public policy, um, and that includes providing advice on laws, policies, and programs, uh, both to you know, federal government departments. Uh, we provide advice to other levels of government as well from time to time, and certainly to uh, stakeholders organizations and advocacy groups. We conduct uh, public education uh, activities and those can take many different forms. And we engage with uh, regional and international bodies, primarily the United Nations, uh, although some others as well. <clears throat> I don't know the level of familiarity uh, that individuals participating in the webinar today have with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, so maybe I'll spend a few minutes on that. It was uh, finalized in, in 2008 and was ratified by Canada in 2010. Um, it is uh, a very unique human rights treaty at the, at the international level. Canada is a party to seven different uh, human rights treaties, all of which set out uh, various rights. The two kind of uh, first human rights treaties uh, set out the civil and political rights that one enjoys and the economic, social, and cultural rights that one enjoys. After those two initial treaties, uh, many of those that followed targeted specific groups. Uh, so you have the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination or of Discrimination Against Women. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is the newest and shiniest of the treaties. And it is, it's very much unique um, in that it uh, attempts to correct some of the deficits uh, that have been noted over the years with the international system of monitoring and reporting. It doesn't create any new rights or obligations. Uh, it just really takes the existing rights and puts those through the lens of a person with the lived experience of having a disability. I wanna talk just a minute about, uh, you know, some of those flaws that, that we had talked about. Traditionally, countries sign on to these international agreements and agree by law to be bound by them. But the only way of really checking whether they were doing what they said they were would be doing was through a reporting process uh, that is set out in the treaty. So every four or five years, uh, there would be a formal hearing uh, in Geneva at uh, the UN at the UN offices in Geneva. And the state party provides a report, other advocacy organizations are able to provide counter views, uh, to what the state has said about how well it is doing in implementing the obligations that it has. And then a committee of experts, uh, known as a treaty body, would provide a set, a set of observations and recommendations for the country on how it could do better in implementing the obligations that it has under a particular treaty. As you might imagine, 
this process was of limited utility. Uh, for one, it only happened every four or five years, and in the intervening period, in most cases, very little happened. That's certainly what we have, uh, what the experience has been in Canada. As well, it's a process that really happens far away in Geneva and is very far removed from the lives of the actual rights holders under these conventions. Uh, it was generally, you know, large organizations uh, that are able to participate in any kind of way in these processes. And so the real story of how, how people are enjoying their rights is often missed in a process like that. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities attempts to do things a little bit differently. As part of uh, the obligations set out in the treaty, a country that, that agrees to be bound by it is also responsible for designating what's known as a, a domestic monitoring mechanism. And that's meant to be a body that monitors how a country is doing in implementing uh, the, the obligations that it has, not every four or five years and reporting to a, a body in far away Geneva, uh, but every day and providing actual information and recommendations at home on an ongoing basis about what needs to happen in order to make sure that the country is living up to the obligations uh, that it has and the promises it has made to the rights holders. Uh, in June of last year, with the passage of the Accessible Canada Act, the Canadian Human Rights Commission uh, was designated as the body responsible for monitoring Canada's implementation of the CRPD here in Canada. And as that body, uh, we will examine and report on gaps relating to uh, Canada's implementation and make recommendations on, uh, to governments on how to do this better. The other kind of unique innovation about the CRPD is that it makes specific reference to the vital importance of doing all monitoring work in conjunction with both the rights holders themselves, individuals with disabilities, and the organizations that advocate on their behalf. I, I guess I should say uh, organizations and other individuals, uh, allies, um, caregivers, others who advocate on behalf of uh, individuals with disabilities. And this is very much unique uh, to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And uh, it's something that as the body responsible for monitoring implementation here in Canada, the commission is, uh, is very cognizant of. We, we have, um, in doing this work, uh, we've attempted to, uh, to develop partnerships and collaborate closely with individuals with disabilities and, uh, and other organizations. And uh, Jonathan referenced today, um, some work that we have collaboratively done uh, together in the past, uh, and certainly it's top of mind as we as we do our work in this area. So I want to just take a bit of a moment uh, to talk about a human rights lens and what does that mean. Uh, the title, I think, of my presentation today was about a human rights lens and the national autism strategy. So uh, when I say that, what is it that I mean? The, when I say uh, that we should be putting a human rights lens on this, it really refers to viewing uh, persons affected by the National Autism Strategy as rights holders and participants and not simply as objects of, uh, of the strategy. Uh, it means involving uh, those whose rights are going to be impacted uh, actually in the development and delivery of the strategy. And certainly that is the way that the Canadian Human Rights Commission looks at its work in uh, monitoring the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities here in Canada as well. It ultimately is work that is being done uh, on behalf of those uh, who, who live uh, the reality uh, having a disability and whose rights uh, need to be uh, respected and upheld. And so it's very important um, if, we, if we're going to talk about uh, taking a human, what's a human rights lens, it's important uh, that those individuals be directly involved 
in the work that, that is being done on their behalf. We're in the process right now of uh, developing a framework for monitoring, uh, and, but we believe there's a great deal of potential for collaboration. Examples uh, may include the development of a set of indicators uh, to measure progress on implementation. Uh, it could include a strategy for the collection and dissemination of disaggregated data. And of course, we'll be developing public education and advocacy plans for areas of priority. Some examples could include work and employment, inclusive education, and uh, accessibility, of course. Uh, right now, we're in the process of finalizing uh, a, uh, a jumping off point for this. As I said, we would like to be doing this work in with the partnership, collaboration, and input of those who are uh, meant to be the, you know, the the, the rights holders under the Convention on the Rights of Dis uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And so we want to hear from you about what monitoring will look like uh, or what it should look like for you, what you want to see, what your priorities are, uh, how and if you'd like to be involved in that process of monitoring. And so in the coming months, uh, we will be uh, coming out with a survey to start to collect that data. Um, and it will really just be the very first step in, in uh, figuring out how to move forward in partnership and collaboration uh, with organizations such as CASDA and of course with individuals uh, who, who uh, would like to be involved as well. Um, I am a speaker who likes to, to keep it short and sweet on these kinds of things uh, and engage in a bit of a conversation. Uh, and so I know that there is a, a question and answer box that is available uh, for your questions, comments, uh, anything you'd like to me to expand on or to discuss in greater detail. Perhaps, um, you know, Jonathan, if you have any questions, <laughs> we can start with you. <laughs> Sure thing. Thanks for that presentation. And it's really clear, and I think you've laid out for a lot of our, our members, you know, what what a strategy uh, could look like um, in terms of a collaboration and just some more background about um, what you guys do and, and that monitoring piece. I think that's um, of great interest. Um, I guess, you know, I can start off with a few questions. And um, as I speak, the rest of you, please feel free to um, type in your questions, comments, and your thoughts. Um, I guess one thing about, you know, this idea of making sure that uh, the rights holders and participants are, are involved in the development of a national autism strategy and as well. Um, you know, I think at CASA we feel the same way. We think it, it is, it should be obviously having that first voice. At the same time, we, we often struggle to uh, think about, you know, because autism is a spectrum and you have people um, who, who, have different capability in participating uh, and representing themselves. Um, we we often have you know try to find this balance and maybe maybe your thoughts about what does it mean to have sort of a maximal self determination um, when those types of situations occur. Absolutely, uh, and you know I think you're so right um, that uh, what participation means uh, to individuals really uh, it's such uh, such a unique thing in all cases. And I think uh, one of the things that we're keeping in mind as we, we think about our monitoring work, you know, I, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, it's a bureaucratic uh, organization, part of the federal government. I think we, we talk in policy development and parliamentary committee appearances and reports and things like that. Uh, and I think with this, with this initiative in monitoring the convention, it's really important for us to get out of that box uh, and, and figure out what it is that monitoring looks like to people. Uh, what, does, what does that mean? Does that mean storytelling? Does it mean public events? Um, does it mean art? Uh, does it, uh, you know, what, what does that actually mean to different people? Um, and I think that's why we want to hear from individuals about what what is going to be meaningful in their lives. The, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities isn't something 
um, that is for you know a, a bureaucratic institution or me to create work and you know things to do it's something that really needs to mean something in people's lives um, and so uh, we we want to hear those things uh, in order to maximize people's opportunity to participate yeah yeah great great um, I don't see any questions coming in I don't know if it's because a technical thing or uh, issue or not but um, I guess another question is, as I'm monitoring the chat boxes um, is, you know, when you talk about the sort of disaggregating data um, and a part of what we're looking at in the National Autism Strategy is you know, understanding what's going on across the provinces, the differences, um, finding the gaps, where they are, you know, looking at minority groups, for example, or rural areas, indigenous populations. What, how, how would that look like from your, your angle in terms of rolling out a monitoring? Yeah, I think that's one of the big questions. Uh, you know, it's certainly something that we see um, or that we hear all the time, uh, and it's a common, it's a common not complaint, uh, but a common frustration. Um, both, you know, uh, and it's not, it's not just for advocates uh, that this is a frustration. I think it's, it's, fr it's frustrating for uh, people who are trying to develop programs and policies too, is they just simply don't have the the data about what the problems are, uh, who's experience what, experiencing what kind of issues, uh, where are there regional differences? Is there a difference between um, someone who's living in a remote uh, community versus someone who's in an urban center? All of those kinds of things. And so a key component <clears throat> of our strategy is really uh, working with uh, those um, who already have some of this information. You know, there's a lot of information out there. People collect a lot of information, uh, but it's all siloed into different organizations. There's no way to compile that all together to kind of get a meaningful picture. And so don't, I don't have the answer to it, um, but it certainly is top of mind that before you can correct a problem, you actually need to know what the problem is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I, I think it would be fair to say that we have anecdotal um, information to indicate what some of the problems are, but we need something a little more than that. So that'll be a, a key priority of the work that we'll do moving forward. Yeah, no, that's a yeah, that's a great great way to think about it. There are a few questions coming in. Before I uh, read them out, uh, Nikki, if you can type in your question using the Q and A, I think I see your hand raised, but I think you got to type something in there. Um, got a few. Uh, so the first one here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Would the C, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission be willing to assist autistic adult associations in developing tools or methods for reaching out to other autistic adults who have trouble with representation? So going in line with what we were talking about earlier, um, yeah, how, yeah, how would that work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that, uh, that uh, again, I, I think that's what I was trying to say before very ineloquently, um, is we're, we're very used to, you know, speaking the, the language of bureaucrats at the commission, and we're very much trying to change that uh, so that we are communicating effectively with all of those people who, who want to and can um, contribute in a really important way uh, to, uh, to um, the implementation of the CRPD here in Canada. So I guess what I would say is absolutely um, that would be something that we would be interested in doing is looking at the possibility of developing tools uh, to to reach out um, both to uh, inform people of their rights sure um, but more just to learn about um, their daily experiences and what uh, the changes that they want to see so that we can um, so they can advocate on their own behalf uh, in a way that is meaningful for them um, and so that then we can translate that into bureau speak uh, for for the the people who make the um, the the decisions and the laws and such. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's great. Um, next question: uh, Are there other countries that have started their monitoring under the optional protocol? If yes, what have they found to date? Oh, 
that's a really good question. Um, so I didn't talk a lot about the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but perhaps I'll talk about that a bit right now. Um, so this is a recent development here in Canada, uh, and uh, Canada has recently uh, acceded, uh, it's a strange word, it has agreed to be bound by the optional protocol uh, to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And what the optional protocol does is allows individuals once they have you know done all they can legally in Canada to fix whatever the issue is uh, and they've run out of options here uh, then they can I'm gonna say file a complaint they can take a petition to the United Nations and ask the the same committee of experts that I was talking about earlier uh, to to hear their case uh, and issue recommendations to Canada if they see fit about what needs to change. So it's think of it as another level of courts, um, perhaps uh, at an international level, uh, but without the same kinds of powers to make Canada really do anything. There's a persuasive authority there, but ultimately, um, as is you know, it, as is the case with all of these obligations at the international level, there's uh, there is not a domestic legal way to make Canada do anything. Um, other, but, uh, you know, so I'll talk about, you know, there's lots of other countries uh, that have uh, started doing monitoring work related to the convention writ large, uh, and also uh, have had the experience of dealing with the optional protocol. Um, I think you've, you've got kind of mixed results, uh, certainly before, when, before we were even as ever designated as the the monitoring mechanism we looked to other countries to see what what others are doing and is there a model out there that we think would work for us i think the conclusion that we came to uh canada is a bit of a unique kind of place um a lot of that has to do with our our reality as a federal state uh with multiple jurisdictions and differences between jurisdictions and and those kinds of things. And so we're, we're learning the lessons of other countries uh, while still trying to develop a, a very much made in Canada approach. I think some countries, uh, certainly there have been, you know, we work closely with other human rights commissions around the world, and we've certainly heard some success stories uh, about measures that, that governments have taken as a result of the recommendations made uh, by the monitoring mechanism or uh, as a result of advocacy by individuals and, and advocacy organizations. And we've also heard, you know, success stories of, of countries having implemented uh, the recommendations made uh, based on a petition filed under the optional protocol. So I think there's lots of reasons to, um, to there's lots of good examples, uh, uh, lots of examples of good practice out there. Uh, and. Um, and lots of reasons to be optimistic that this is, this is uh, a model of monitoring that, that can yield results. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's, you know, we're doing the same thing. How do we learn from others um, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and get their lessons, right? I think that's going to be important as we move forward. Absolutely. Um, next question. Uh, how can you, uh, can you talk a little more about the how of making sure folks with autism are at the core of this policy work, as well as how caregivers are included in this work. Oh, that's such an important point. Um, and, and I guess that's, uh, you know, I alluded a bit to some of the work that we're doing. You know, it sounds, uh, it sounds like kind of a bureaucratic thing to do, but um, the, the first thing that we want to do is we want to ask people how they want to be included. Uh, and we're doing that through a survey because it seems to be uh, a way to reach in this vast land of ours, especially in this time. Um, it seems to be a way to reach the greatest number of people, which is what we want uh, to do. Um, but we don't know how people uh, want to want to be engaged, uh, whether they um, they want to, uh, you know, uh, for us to have town halls, whether they uh, want to be able to provide feedback directly to us kind of on an ongoing basis uh, about policies and, and uh, you know, issues that they're experiencing. We, we really don't, we don't have the answer to that question. And so we really need um, individuals' inputs, uh, both, you know, and as you, you've referenced here, um, individuals 
folks with autism, uh, as well as caregivers, uh, we're very cognizant uh, of the need to involve really anybody um, who who is someone who is a rights holder, uh, and that includes uh, both individuals who who uh, experience disability and and those who are in their lives. That's something you know to jump in on that question too. Like it's something we're thinking about like, as uh, how you know how can we be a channel. Um, being a national alliance of many members to be able to, you know, as we connect with uh, the Human Rights Commission, uh, kind of passing on that message and, and making sure we're a conduit for information flow um, so that this is as well informed as it can be. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, next one we have here, uh, how would you expect human rights policies for individuals with disabilities to adapt in the coming years due to the evolving integration of artificial intelligence in our society and the effect on job displacement? Big question. Wow, <laughs> that is an excellent question um, and certainly something that we have uh, turned our minds to at the Canadian Human Rights Commission as, as many others have turned their minds to. It's one of those things that we would class as a, you know, an emerging um, an emerging uh, human rights issue uh, that we're all grappling with at the present time. And, and there are just so many different elements to this. You know, the, if we're talking about the integration of artificial intelligence into various aspects of our society, with that comes all kinds of questions about, as you, as you say, um, job displacement. Uh, that's a huge issue. Uh, and what, what do you do uh, to ensure that there are meaningful opportunities for work and employment uh, where things are increasingly automated uh, or are using artificial intelligence? It's a huge area um, that a lot of people are looking at. Um, and again, I'm afraid I don't have any answers, but, <laughs> but certainly it's something everyone's looking at. You know, and another, another aspect of it, um, if you're a talking about the integration of artificial intelligence uh, into various aspects of our life, then it's so important to make sure that uh, the use of that for efficiency isn't replicating some of the potentially discriminatory impacts of decision making. Um, you know, an algorithm is only go as good as, uh, as those who, who wrote it and the assumptions that they made uh, in so doing. Uh, and so we've seen all kinds of examples uh, of, you know, uses of artificial intelligence that end up having or having either having or having the potential uh, to perpetuate uh, situations of discrimination. Um, and, and now it's an algorithm that's doing it. Uh, but, it, but those things are really important to be considering as we move forward um, in this, you know, more digital world. And I think, you know, if the, if the current situation has taught us nothing, um, I think it's taught us that, uh, that probably we can expect more, not less uh, of these kinds of things, um, more, more of the virtual um, and the, the, yeah, more of that moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, it, a really great question uh, and, and something that we certainly have uh, on our mind. Okay, that was the last of the questions that have come in. Um, let me just check the Q&A. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, so, Nikki wanted to ask a question about uh, human rights monitoring in relation to research. Um, organizations oh. such as Kids Brain Health Network have an inclusive uh, process for funding neurodevelopmental research co-production. Should an ethical review of research protocols by the ethics review committees include uh, a CRHC or C CHRC indicator respecting the rights and inclusiveness of individuals directly involved in the research being done on their behalf. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm just, I'm rereading the question on my screen. Um, inclusive, oh wow, for funding, for research, wow. Yeah. Oh, these are some <laughs> good questions you guys are throwing at me today. This is not one that I anticipated. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when I'm talking about, <laughs> I guess my short answer would be uh, yes, um, that uh, in all, 
but I, I guess it, it's the view from which I come at the world uh, that really uh, I, I think every uh, process, every, um, every uh, process or, uh, yeah, I'll just use the word process, that we undertake should really be run through a human rights lens. And as I, I talked about, uh, that really means considering, you know, the variable impacts on uh, different individuals. And the only way that you're really going to do that in a meaningful way is to include them in, in the process, uh, regardless of whether it's you know, developing a research proposal, or it's writing policy, or it's uh, deciding on um, a community plan, uh, you know, a, a housing development, any of those kinds of things, all of them, you can take the same, the same lens of a human rights based approach. Uh, and you can run it through that. And so I think, you know, does that turn into an indicator? I don't know. I would certainly advocate um, uh, in favor of making sure that those who are impacted are really included in these kinds of things. Um, uh, but uh, I'm that that's intriguing. The the idea of what an indicator would look like in that in that circumstance. I'm not sure. That's an interesting. Um, I know I'm not so, you know, I know you're the speaker, I just, but I like to think about this too. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I, I kind of see it as, um, you know, the, the idea that research ethics boards were put together, you know, compared to clinical treatment or something was we thought there were potential harms that might be in research and uh, as opposed to clinical treatment. It's, it, there's a bit of a different lens. And yeah, and the idea to, to have a protection lens on, you know, to make sure those rights are there, um, especially with people with disabilities. And then also, you know, what would it look like if, you know, research, if, if research was done in a different way, you know, that like co-production and, and not just moving on the protection side, but the promotion side of their rights in, in the, in the co-production of research, right? And, oh, really, that's a really, really interesting question. Yeah. Really thought-provoking. Yeah, that's yeah. a very thought-provoking question. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, one more came in. I guess it's like, wow! <laughs> so Yay! Address the, it says, could you address the issue of ABA? So ABA is um, a, a behavioral analysis, um, applied behavioral analysis. Uh, it's being used, uh, it's being implemented across, ca across Canadian provinces, and there are serious conditions. Uh, sorry, sir, I, I got to be able to read. Okay, let's start again. Could you address the issue yeah. of Behavioral analysis is being implemented across Canadian provinces, and there are serious uh, concerns from the stake, all stakeholder fields, including emerging research, that this approach is abusive and damaging in the long term. I know you're not an expert in the field, but if there's anything you want to shine light on in terms of human rights, what would you say? Absolutely. Yeah. And again, I'm not an expert um, in the field by any means. Uh, but I would say certainly um, these are important issues to to raise in the context if we're talking about uh, you know the rights that that one has uh, both under domestic human rights law um, not to be discriminated against or subject to harm uh, because of their disability um, it, both you know under domestic law and under uh, international law under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and, you know, this, it's probably, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in a lot of things, uh, but uh, this is probably something that I am um, less of, even less of an expert in, in that uh, it's, it, it's probably something that is more provincially or territorially regulated, uh, as opposed to it being a, a federal undertaking. Um, but I think the, the principles uh, remain the same, uh, that, um, that you know, everybody has the right uh, to, to live the lives that they are able and wish to have um, without discrimination. Uh, and if there are discriminatory impacts uh, of any kind um, of, of program uh, or um, you know, analysis that's going on, uh, then it, the, same, the same kinds of principles apply. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll put a plug in for uh, for the importance of partnerships and collaboration is that it's exactly issues like this uh, that 
that we are unaware of at the Canadian Human Rights Commission uh, because we haven't had those partnerships with organizations for whom this is a, a significant priority. Uh, and so those kinds of things um, need to be brought to our attention um, along with, you know, ideas and proposals about what needs to change uh, to, to better protect everyone's human rights. Great. Okay, I think that's the last of the questions that we have. Any, I guess, closing statement, closing words, uh, things to share from you before we call it? You know, it was it was fantastic uh, to uh, to be able to participate with you all on this webinar. Uh, there are, you know, as always happens, there are some. Um, groups of individuals and stakeholder organizations that we we work with more frequently than others and it's been such a pleasure uh, to work with Kazda and with Jonathan um, I think this is my first outing to a to a webinar or similar type of event uh, with Kazda and I hope it won't be my last I, I very much hope uh, to to get an opportunity uh, to meet all of you in person at some point yep hopefully soon thank you very much <laughs> our, some of our participants say thank you very much Tabitha uh, so be sure to fill out our feedback form, which um, will be sent to you if you register through Eventbrite. Um, the video will be posted on our YouTube channel like the other ones. Um, if you need a French copy of the presentation or have other questions, um, click on that description under the YouTube, I guess the YouTube description. Um, there will be a link there uh, for the feedback server where you can, uh, we can get in touch with you and get you in touch with Tabitha and the Human Rights Commission. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.